Um, first, we're going to get started talking about NBA. So I'll let my favorite girl, Dag, Eric, uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on um, this week with the NBA. I know yeah. we were hoping they were coming back, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it looks like our excitement has to be uh, tapered down just a little bit. Um, right now, there has been a recent spike in the COVID cases in Florida. Um, as of yesterday, I haven't seen what it was today, but as of yesterday, they had set new daily records seven of the last 10 days. There are over 90,000 cases at this point. Uh, wow. The NBA is a little concerned about the, the spike in numbers. Um, obviously, they want the games to come back. And the whole idea of having this centralized NBA within Orlando uh, is, is a little frightening for a lot of guys because, as we know, there are a lot of uh, fathers within the NBA and a lot of family men within the NBA who may not want to run that risk. Uh, so right now the NBA is trying to figure out how to accommodate everybody and also keep track of these numbers as we approach. We're about four weeks away from the restart of the uh, NBA season. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's such a valid concern. I mean, I think COVID has kind of gotten lost, you know, in conversation, kind of uh, our, our attention quickly focused to protesting and the Black Lives Matter movement, which I'm in full support of, but there's still some major health risk and issues out here. Obviously, you know, stores are not even allowing you to enter without a mask. So I do think it is the right thing for the NBA and just for all of us to reconsider reopening certain things. Um, but especially with NBA season, um, you know, it's not just the players playing, it's the fans in the stadium. It's um, the close quarters that athletes are in. So, I mean, even though I would love for NBA to be back soon, um, I just hope that they're extra precautious um, in deciding whether or not they want to return. I mean, it, it just sucks that they were, everything was like moving smoothly, but then the, the state itself, you know what I'm saying, saw a, a huge spike in the numbers. Right. Um, now, they will be in, you know, the, the NBA bubble, which, you know what I'm saying, obviously that's going to be a, a huge advantage for them as long as you don't leave that bubble. Um, and they're going to be, you know, they'll, they'll have the testing every day going on, and I'm sure they're going to test everyone before even entering the, the, the bubble. Um, so, you know, hopefully they can still continue and, and manage to put the rest of, of the season on. But if it gets if this is too crazy, then honestly, it's, it's not even worth it. Yeah. And what's interesting about this, you know, debate on whether or not they're going to postpone just last week on the show, we had a discussion about Kyrie Irving, who basically said, listen, I don't really think that we should start the season back up. I think we should continue to push to push the issue of black lives um, matter that they matter and just continue the discussion in America about black lives. So it's kind of ironic that this week now we're like, hey, we might have to still push this back because of COVID. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to dive in deeper with, with those comments that Kyrie said, because now Kendrick Perkins went on air and basically stated that, you know, he felt like, listen, you know, Kay Kyrie's my brother and everything, but I think that it was foolish. Um, he did not agree with his statements at all. Um, and that resulted... Uh, well, let me just back up. His statement that he said about Kyrie was that he was confused and he's showing lack of leadership. So that's heavy to, to, to sit on air and say that about your brother and about your other, you know, NBA counterpart. And so that resulted in KD calling Kendrick Perkins a sellout. And even that, you know, in our community, calling someone a sellout, calling them a coon, calling them things like that, that's a serious you know, that's serious. So, um, you know, Kendrick Perkins definitely responded saying, you know, Katie's my brother. There's been times that he and I have been in the locker room crying together. And we were both fighting this issue of, you know, African-American equality. Um, but I just don't agree with Kyrie's statement. Um, you know, I think for him to sit on air and, and call him foolish and lack leadership, I didn't like that comment. And I can see why KD didn't like it. Um, but what are your guys' thoughts on kind of that back and forth? I'm, let me, I'm gonna go first, Eric, because I know you want to go in. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm with uh, Kendrick Perkins on this. Perkins, um, I, I agree with him. You know, I when 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 Kyrie made those comments, I don't think that he had a plan mapped out. I just think, you know, he was 
speaking off of his emotion of not getting an invite, um, you know, to the to the bubble. And, you know, he kind of took that and was like, you know what, nah, let me, if I, they don't want me to go, let me, let me throw a wrench in, in everybody's game type of situation. Um, because, you know, personally, like, I know I've, I've seen, you know, Kyrie, you know, say rest in peace and, and different things like that. But honestly, I haven't heard too many stories about Kyrie being on the front lines. And I don't even mean protesting. I mean, just like, you know, you see the things that, that guys like, like LeBron do off the, off the court. I don't hear too many things like that about Kyrie. And that's not to say he doesn't have those things going on, but you know what I'm saying? I just don't, I haven't really heard too much about it. So I'm with Perk. And then as far as the whole sellout thing goes, that, that's kind of crazy in itself. Like you said, M, that's one of the top insults that you can pretty, you know, that you can throw at a, at a black person that's calling him a sellout. And I really love the way Kendrick Perkins handled it. Yeah. Uh, you know, he came on television. He spoke to, to Kevin Durant like a man um, mm -hmm. in public because you called him a sell sellout in public. Um, right. but it's the same sellout that had you in his home with his wife and with his children. Um, so, you know, my thing with that is even if, if you really did feel that way, that's a conversation that as brothers, we need to have on the, on the phone, not you tweeting out that I'm a sellout or not you saying that in, in the, to, to the public that I'm a sellout. If that's how you really feel. You know what I'm We could talk about that as men because I get so, you know, disappointed when we go at each other in public like that. It just, you know, it just shows that divisiveness that we don't really need, especially not right now. Yeah. Um, Trip, you're right. And uh, I want to start off by commending Perkins and the way he handled it. Um, I haven't always agreed with Kendrick Perkins' opinion or point of view on a lot of sports topics, but mm -hmm. on this one, I think he's correct. And he handled it with class. Uh, I'm sure he was very angry uh, and very hurt by the things that Kevin Durant said to him, because as he highlighted, Kevin Durant had been in his home and Perkins' wife had cooked dinner for them before. And um. Perkins Perkins' kids looked at Kevin Durant almost like an uncle. So to say I'm, I'm a sellout, like, bro, it's as simple as you picking up the phone and we could just hash this out. Um, but the reason I agree with Perk, and as Anthony already highlighted, you know, in this type of environment and, and what's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. um, division is the worst thing that could happen. The moment yeah. the outsiders see that there's division amongst us, they will pick at that scab. And mm -hmm. so the, the best thing Kevin Durant could have done is say, look, let me just get Perk on the phones and say, look, Perk, I don't agree with what you said. You shouldn't use your platform that way. We could talk about this behind the scenes. But to call him a sellout and to, you know, kind of chastise him and, and on social media that way mm -hmm. was the worst thing that Kevin Durant could have done. And I'm, I'm truly disappointed in Kevin Durant um, because I'm, I'm going to be honest, as a sports fan, I think Kevin Durant is a beast. You know, yeah. don't get me wrong. I, I don't want people to confuse the two. He is a monster. As a Knicks fan, I wanted Kevin Durant to come to the Knicks. Um, but the childish behavior we continue to see from Kevin Durant shows us that he is not the leader that he thinks he is. Um, he constantly is, is back and forth with tweets with people. He constantly takes offense anytime someone doesn't see his point of view. He's almost like a bratty child that now has become a bratty adult. Mm -hmm. And at some point, he's got to realize that he's doing more harm to the movement than good. I mm -hmm. get Kyrie's point of view. And I said this last week, I agree with Kyrie. You don't want to distract from the narrative and you don't want to take attention away from the black lives matter movement, but mm -hmm. telling players they shouldn't go play. Isn't the right way to go about it because there are a lot of guys who need this paycheck. There are a lot of guys who need to support their family off being able to play basketball. And so when you're sitting in your mansion and you got a hundred million dollars secure and you know, you can't go to Orlando because let's not get it confused. Kyrie can't even go to Orlando because he's not playing. So it's easy for him to say, oh, we, nobody should go. Yeah. And for Kevin Durant to try to call somebody else a sellout for saying, oh, Kyrie doesn't have the plan in place yet. That's wrong, uh, uh, Kevin Durant. You got to be a bigger leader in this moment right now. So you, you both made excellent points. And this, it's something that I didn't think about until really, Eric, you kind of went, you went, really went in about the plan, right? So at first, when I had seen the comment that Kendrick Perkins said, I kind of like, I didn't like it because I, I, my mind went to where, what you just said about showing division and showing it, but also showing it and speaking it on a public forum. I feel like in this time, unity, black unity, and, and just for our faces to be on one accord is very important. I did end up seeing the actual full quote of Kendrick Perkins, which actually 
Um, this is why I hate with media. Sometimes you see, you read stuff out of context, you know, you see that little paragraph. So for me, I saw the comment of your, the confusion and lacking leadership. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that because I did agree with Kyrie saying, no, let's continue to focus on African-American issues. And I'm all for that. But you know, the way that our ancestors were able to really rally together back in the day with civil rights movement and all of these things, you know, even Harriet Tubman with the Underground Railroad, it was through organization and proper planning that we were able to execute boycotts. We were able to execute sit-ins, you know, escape, all these things, it's through organization. So I understand Kendrick Perkins' full, like, yo, we have to have a plan. Uh, and the actual full quote, just so we have it, was um, on Kyrie Irving, right now, you are the distraction. You are the distractor. It's crazy to me because you come out and you do something simple without talking to President Chris Paul or consoling with Michael Roberts. Let's sit out without a plan. It makes zero sense, and I totally disagree. So when I, when I seen that full quote, I was like, okay, I get it. Yeah. You know, because it, it's kind of like just sit out. Like, if anything, they have more power when they are in the limelight and have the capital and the and the money to make moves. Because this is chess, not check. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. kind of where they have to look at it. So I think, you know, um, as far as KD's comments, it, it's definitely unfortunate because I always think that he's super – I would hope that he would take the high road because I am a big fan of him on and off the court. I think he's always been a class act, I feel. So I, the lately, the tweeting and just kind of the, the childish things, um, we don't like to see this from KD at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I pray, I pray that these guys kind of are able to talk this off, talk this out off camera and really continue to put the pressing issue first. Yeah. And even um, with, to, just to add on to what you were saying about the communication, you know, one, yeah, you didn't, obviously you didn't have this conversation with Chris Paul, the president of the Players Association. I mean, one, because you already know that Chris Paul has been vocal about wanting to play anyway, but that communication goes even further because I could understand if you had a conversation with Adam Silver and, and you know, maybe the owners or whatever like that, and they, and they kind of like just shut you down with what you were trying to do. But you, have, you didn't even reach out to anybody. You were just trying to rally up the troops to say, oh, we, we yeah. shouldn't play. And Adam Silva, and we speak about this all the time, you know, shout out to Adam Silva because he's he's very on point with supporting the players whenever they want to speak out, him saying the right thing and, you know, at, at, at pivotal times um, throughout the, you know, just throughout everything that's that's been going on. So if you had went to him and he shut you down, okay, that's one thing. I'll give you that. But that's not even the case. You didn't even go to him. You didn't even see. You didn't have no ideas of, okay, if players would like to play, what can the NBA do to to help with the movement and everything that we're going on? And, and again, Eric, I commend you because you had some great ideas um, a couple of weeks ago in regards to things that the NBA could do while the players are there. Because, again, like you said, they do have a lot more power when they're on camera because you got to think, as soon as the NBA comes back, everybody's going to be locked in. So that means you got millions upon millions of eyes on the NBA because they want us, They need something to grasp onto. That's one of the reasons why the last dance did what it did, because there was literally nothing else on. So now you bring the NBA back, getting ready to go into the playoffs. We've missed all of that. This is your prime opportunity to now work with the NBA to put out, you know, the same way like the NFL – the players had that statement that they put out. Now you can be doing, you know, things like that. So, you, you know, you got that opportunity. But he didn't, have, he didn't have that conversation, which is why I just feel like with him, it's coming from a different place. He's coming from a place where, oh, I wasn't going to be able to go. So now let me throw a wrench in the game for everybody else. Right. And, and that's why I said I, I don't – his message is correct. And I don't want anybody, anybody to misinterpret what we're saying. We agree right. with Kyrie Irving. This is the time to take advantage of the platform. And, and people's attention. But when you just kind of just throwing something out there and then hoping everybody follows, that's not the way to go about it. Um, and the NBA has recently released a commercial with ESPN um, where they say it's, it's bigger than basketball. It's bigger than just a moment. And we also got to remember, and I want to shout out uh, uh, Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes because uh, I love their podcast, All, uh, All the Smoke. 
and and the things they're talking about. And they they they're kind of on different sides, at, opinion wise, on Kyrie's um, uh, thoughts on on what the NBA should do. But I want to shout them guys out because Matt Barnes was on the Clipper team back in 2014 when the whole Donald Sterling saga happened, and mm. he has said himself, "We didn't know what to do because we didn't have." somebody driving a decision for us we didn't know whether we should boycott the game we didn't know if we should just quit the whole rest of the season we didn't know what to do so the only thing they could come up with was we're gonna we're gonna go to center court we're gonna drop the um the warm-up uniforms there and we're gonna kind of do a silent boycott and protest and but he said himself had we had some direction we probably would have sat out the rest of the playoffs and we would have we would have made the nba make a choice as to whether they're going to make us forfeit these games or they're going to really attack the situation. Adam Silver, I think, as a commissioner, has always done a great job of addressing issues head on at the moment. He hasn't right. let them linger. And that's why I think the NBA is on the heels of the NFL has taken over as the premier sport in America, because we see these things. We see the NBA is willing to address these topics. And I think this is one of those moments, as Matt Barnes is referencing from 2014, that we didn't have the direction then, but if you put the right direction now and the right leadership now, you could be way more powerful in addressing mm-hmm. these topics and make sure that these topics just don't fall by the wayside. So mm-hmm. Kyrie, again, we're not disagreeing with you, but it's got to be with leadership. You just can't tell guys don't go. And then it's like, all right, so now what? So we don't go. And then what? We just sit home. And, right. and, and, and what else we do after that? And you lose your power when you're not in the limelight. You lose your power when you're not financially capable to invest in things and, and really make real changes. So I, I completely agree. And I think um, back to your comment of why the NBA was, is kind of a leading premier franchise or, or sport over NFL. It is reasons like that, you know, for sure. And I think this is the time right now for companies and organizations to really rise to the occasion. And I think that it is important to keep this race you know, racism topic just alive and well, because even with the NFL, I mean, we could really sit here and look at the lack of black quarterbacks and that whole stereotype and that, and that whole issue that really needs to be at the forefront. Like that, that's something that they've had a break for a long time of really not addressing that. Right. And the lack of black, you know, leadership and owners. So what's good. Misfit murder gang. We in the building. Make sure y'all check out my last battle fire. Always bodies. After that, check out Real Fans Real Talk.